Hey everyone, this is Kevin from thechesswebsite.com, and we are in round 12 of our coverage of the 2021 Canada's Tournament Race to See who will face Magnus Carlsen later this year for the World Championship. This tournament does have 14 rounds, so including today, there are three rounds left. They do have a day off tomorrow, and then they'll come back for the final two rounds, but round 12 is extremely important, and we do have some big matchups. Our matchup today we're going to be going over could not be more significant. White's going to be played by Fabiano Caruana. He won this tournament a few years ago. His opponent, Anish Giri, playing the black pieces, probably has the best shot at eclipsing Jan Nepo for first place right now. But Fabiano, if he gets a victory here, string along a couple victories in his last two games, and he could see himself at the top of the table. So we'll go ahead and get into it. Fabiano starts out with E4. We see the Sicilian. Pawn c5, net f3, pawn to e6, and we see exchange in the center of the board. And then we get into the four knights variation in the Sicilian, which we don't see all that often. And then pawn to a3. So immediately, Fabiano going for something not the main line. Usually in the four knight variation, you see knight to b5, putting a lot of pressure on this d6 square right here. Uh, when you know the knight can come here to d6, checking the king, can't really do anything about that. And so usually the bishop takes, the queen comes up here and takes here on d6. It's kind of an awkward position. So usually d6 from black here, bishop to f4 potentially, pawn e5, really forcing the bishop to g5. Uh, pinning that knight, and the knight comes back here to a3. But said, you know what? We're not going to be dealing with that. We're going to try something else. We're going to play pawn here to a3. Bishop here e7, bishop to e3, and then bishop here to e2. You can see usually after bishop to e3, you usually see queen to d2, preparing to castle on the queen side. Bishop to e2 right after kind of leaves the door open. Fabiano can either castle on the queen or the king side. Uh, kind of up to him, depending on how black continues here. Pawn to d6, sort of the, the main theme that you'll see from black standpoint in the four knights variation. Queen here to d3, so to prepare on the queen side if he wants to. Bishop here to d7, and then pawn to f4. So pretty aggressive. Could have just castled on the king side, had some king side safety with these pawns. Decides to go for the aggressive approach. And knowing that Fabiano really needs a victory here and at least one more, potentially two more for the rest of the tournament, sometimes you have to wonder if the variations that he's choosing are knowing that he has to get a victory. He can't play uh, drawish at all, which is, from a fan standpoint, always fun to see because these players are going after it. So pawn to f4, definitely the aggressive approach, and then pawn to e5. Fabiano takes the knight here on c6. The pawn recaptures on c6, and you can see that this does open up for an attack on the queen side. There's a semi-open file that the rook can come here to b8 and attack. You could even see the, the queen get involved into the game with b6 attacking the pawn, or even the queen to c7 and then swing the f rook over here to b8 as well. So a lot going on here. Now Fabiano has kind of a choose your own adventure as far as how he wants to continue. He could just play rook over here to f1, not worrying about castling right now. Could just take this pawn here. Maybe after the exchange, he castles on the queen side. Definitely dangerous. Has to worry about all these threats we just talked about. But on the flip side, this is a open file that the queen and rook are already on here. He can swing his other rook here to f1. He has both his bishops. He can start to attack on the queen or the king side of the board. He has a pretty strong attack, and if he wants to play aggressive, that definitely could be an approach. He decides to go for what I consider more of the safer option, and instead of taking here on e5 right away, just decides to castle on the king side. But you can see after the pawn takes, bishop takes on f4, things are still opening up. There's going to be fireworks. Uh, this rook here, semi-open file, and after the bishop to e6, queen over here to g3, uh, both the bishop and the queen attacking this pawn here on d6. And after knight to d7, rook to d1. So Fabiano getting all of his pieces involved into the action. Both of these rooks are in semi-open files, which is definitely where you want your rooks to be. Open files are semi-open files, meaning that there's no at least one pawn uh, gone. So that gives them room to breathe, really attack. But you can also see this rook here on d1. White has the bishop, the queen, and the rook here on d1, all attacking this pawn here on d6. 
or I see rook here to e8, and then king to h1. And really the threat that Fabiano is looking at is, okay, the, the queen can just come down here to b6, and that's going to check the king here on g1, and then just take that pawn here on b2. So decides, okay, let's go ahead and get the king out of harm's way, king to h1, and then queen to b8. Now, if you start to calculate how many pieces are attacking this, black is definitely down. You have the bishop, the queen, and the rook all attacking this pawn, and it's defended by just one bishop and a queen. But this queen over here on b8 also attacks the pawn on b2. So if there was an exchange, maybe bishop to d6, Bishop takes, rook takes, the queen can just come down here to b2, uh, and then just threatening all this other material here on the queen side. Uh, just not really as strong as white would really want to. So decides, okay, yes, does have the upper hand on this d6 pawn, but decides to go ahead and play pawn up here to b4 first. Now Nish continues with knight to e5. Pawn up here to b5. We see rook to c8. Pawn takes. Rook takes here on c6, and that up here d5. It's an outpost, but definitely pretty easy to remove that if black wants to. Queen over here to f8, just eyeing down on this pawn here on uh, d6. Pawn here to c3. I think c3 or c4 make a lot of sense here. Uh, but this isolated pawn, as we talked about on this e file, all of a sudden now white has four pawn structures, and these isolated pawns can be easy pickings for black to really attack. And that's exactly what he does. Brings his rook over here to c8, double barreling the rooks here on the c file. Eventually just trying to put too much pressure on his opponent here on c3. Rook to c1, protecting that a little bit. Knight here to g6. Bishop comes back, d2, trying to protect that, which, hey, always good when you are forcing your opponent to play some defense here. Bishop down h4, attacking the queen. Queen to e3. Rook to c5, attacking the knight right here. Pawn up here, c4, adding a level of protection here. And then we see the pawn to h6. Just opening up for the king if it ever needed to come over here to the h file. You don't want to have to worry about some back rank make or anything like that. Also does stop some threats if black is ever worried about some material coming here to the g5 square. Queen over here to b3 and then bishop to g5. Bishop takes, pawn takes, uh, and I think this is a pretty good approach from black standpoint because can bring a rook over here to the h file and really start to attack this king here on h1. So something to think about for the rest of the game. Queen to g3, queen over here to d8, defending the pawn here on g5 that's under attack here. Rook to d1, and now we see the bishop take here on d5. And I really like this continuation that Anish Giri found here, is he recognized that he wants to bring his knight to f4. This is a great outpost. You can see it's on a dark square, and so the light square bishop for white cannot ever take it. And so he decides, you know, normally you don't want to give up a bishop for a knight, especially when it's kind of an open board. The bishop can roam the entire board freely, but he decides that outpost is going to be extremely valuable. So bishop takes, pawn takes here, and then knight to f4. You can see, really difficult to remove this. Uh, a pawn could potentially come up here to g3, but that exposes the king a little bit more. The light square bishop here on e2, it can never move it away. And so you're really looking at, is the rook going to take this and just give up material? Probably not. So this is going to be a huge problem that Fabiano has to deal with the rest of the game. Now, queen comes back to f2. We have rook to c7. Rook up here to d4. Queen to e8. And you can see now the knight and the queen are both attacking this bishop here on e2. Now, this bishop it's defending this pawn here on c4. Both rooks here are attacking this pawn here. This bishop is defending it. Can't just come here to d3 because then it would just fall. And then after the rook takes, okay, you're just giving up an easy pawn here. Uh, and your rook here on c7 is still defending this pawn here on a7. Part of the reason that the queen here on f2 is to uh, also attack this pawn here on a7 uh, after the exchanges. You know, Fabiano is always thinking about what happens with the exchanges. 
And you can't really just play rook to e1 to protect this because rook to e7 adds another layer of attack on this e2 square and things get really complicated. You probably need to bring your rook back here to d2, but then Fabian just playing defense. Now rook to e3 attacking the pawn over here, uh, maybe pawn a4, get it out of harm's way. Queen to e4 attacking this pawn right here, king to g1. Things get pretty difficult. Rook takes here on c4. If the bishop does take, okay, rook takes on e1. Now the bishop come back here, pawn to g4. Uh, you can see this is very, very difficult for white and is just trying to hold on for dear life. So in the game, that's not what we see. Instead of uh, rook to e1, we see Fabiano play bishop to f3. But that opens up, since that bishop was defending it, for the rook to just come down to c4. Now rook takes, rook takes, and that rook on c7 was defending the pawn on a7. So it does allow Fabiano, which is what he was calculating, to play rook to a7. Anish Giri playing at the top of his game right now, I think, also found the move rook to a4. So not just sure if he found just one move further in the calculation, uh, but this is a great find because the rook is protected by the queen here. Queen is forced to move here. And after the queen comes back, you can see the rook takes the pawn here on a3. So going into the end game, black is up a pawn in material, and all the pawns are on one side of the board. Typically, when that happens, a knight is going to fare better than a bishop. A bishop would really like pawns on both sides of the board because the bishop can control the entire board. But a knight can control one side of the board extremely well. Pawn up here to h4, queen down to e5. Pawn takes, queen over here, takes here on g5. Rook to e1, rook up here to a8. Bishop to e4, and I think that's a mistake. Rook comes down here to a2. I, I think it's probably just best to play f5 here. Uh, just puts black in a pretty tough spot here, but that's fine. Uh, bishop to e4, rook down here, a2, attacking the queen. Uh, and, and really, the, the threat here is if the queen takes, uh, well, then the queen can just come over here, attack the king, uh, and should have a pretty big attack going on here. Uh, you, you can see you know, queen to h4, uh, and then can gobble up this rook here on e1, uh, and then just really start to gobble up the rest of the material after you know, check, and then it takes this, this bishop here on e4. So that, that's really the threat here. Uh, Fabiano is not going to fall for that. Plays rook here to b1. Rook comes back to a8. Rook over here to e1, and then pawn to f5. So this not only attacks the bishop here on e4, but after the bishop comes back, then kind of that key move, which, which is what f5 was setting up, and that is king to f7. And the reason king to f7 is so powerful has nothing to do with king safety. He's not worried about the rook coming up here and he wants to be closer to the e-file. None of that. All it's doing is preparing for the rook to come over here to the h-file and attack the king. And you can see what threat does white really have on the king on f7. Not really a whole lot where Anish has a ton of threats on the white king. So rook to e3, just trying to find some sort of defense, trying to get the rook involved into the game. Rook over here to h8, king to g1, but then the devastating move, knight to g2. And in this spot, we do see Faviano resign, just recognizing, yeah, there's no way to really stop this. The knight's going to move. It is going to be a discovered attack, uh, and things are just going to fall. So nice little deflection he's setting up here. You know, you could see queen takes here on f5 check, and yes, the queen is defended by the bishop. So you could say, okay, well, after the queen takes here, the bishop takes, but then you can see the knight takes here on e3. And then you have a knight and a rook versus a bishop. This is going to be a pretty easy end game. So after the knight takes here on g2, a fantastic finishing move by Anishgiri. He gets the victory as the black pieces. Now, for those wondering how the other games went, Jan did win his game as well. So, you know, he was kind of hoping that Jan would tie or lose. He could actually go into first place or at least be for a tie as far as points are concerned. Uh, but he's still half a point back of Jan since Juan, Jan continues to dominate the field here. 
Uh, and it, it seems like Anish Kier is the only one that's going to be able to catch him. So the last two games are going to be pivotal, pivotal, excuse me. Uh, and Anish is playing at the top of his game. So if he can get two victories, it puts a lot of pressure on the top spot there. Uh, it's going to be fun to watch for sure. Definitely excited that all these players almost need victories. And so they're playing a style of chess that I'm not used to seeing in some of these tournaments. Usually see these drawlish slugfests, but it is just wide open. People are taking the most aggressive lines they can find, and it is it is fireworks. Um, there were there were four victories today. So four games happened today, and there was a victory in every single game, not one draw today. That's the type of chess we're seeing. It's exciting to see uh, chess is better for it, I think, from a fan perspective. So thank you guys so much for watching. Definitely enjoyed the games today, and I will see you guys in two days. They are taking a break tomorrow. I'll see you in two days for round 13.